Hello everyone and welcome to another video. I've been making videos about Ryzen laptops lately and I wanted to check out the Intel side of things. The word on the street is that while AMD laptops might have better performance, Intel laptops have better cooling and some extra features. So today, I have a Legion laptop from Lenovo. While on Lenovo's website, a slightly better version sells for around 1000 US or 1500 Canadian dollars, you can get this version often on sale for around 1000 Canadian or slightly under 1000 US dollars. But before we check it out, please consider subscribing to my channel so I can make more videos. Let's check out the design first. There is not much about this laptop that screams gaming. The keyboard looks and feels a lot like a regular Lenovo keyboard. Also, the trackpad is virtually the same as the Lenovo IdeaPad that I tested last summer. And even the lid, aside from the Legion logo, looks a lot like a regular lid. There are two not so small gaming details though. Firstly, I love that the lid doesn't go all the way back to the laptop. This gives the laptop a serious gaming laptop look while also improving the cooling. And secondly, there are four fan intakes on the sides of the laptop and a huge air intake on the bottom. The build quality. Here's the thing. A laptop can be all plastic as long as there's virtually no screen or keyboard flex. I've tested an Asus Tough laptop last summer and even if it was all metal, there was significant keyboard and screen flex. This laptop is all plastic, but there's virtually no keyboard or screen flex. They used a matte, non-slippery plastic around the keyboard, which is very nice to touch. This non-slippery plastic will be very nice after a long gaming session where sweat might be a problem. It also doesn't show any fingerprints, unlike the lid. As the lid is made of regular plastic, it's a fingerprint magnet. Its bottom corners are round, so it won't hurt your legs when you use it on your lap. Let's look at the specs now. It is a 4-core, 8-thread Intel i5-10300H with a base clock of 2.5GHz, a boost clock of 4.5GHz, and a total cache of 8MB. As you can imagine, the 10300H is on 14 nanometers, and we'll check how much of an effect it has on performance and thermals. It also has an NVIDIA GTX 1650Ti graphics unit. It's not the Max-Q variant, it has 4GB of GDDR6 memory and a base clock of 1350MHz. We'll talk more about the processor and the GPU later, but for now, let's have a look at the rest of the specs. It has a 15.6-inch 1080p IPS screen with a refresh rate of 120Hz. I know that the GTX 1650Ti won't be able to reach 120fps in demanding games, but even in simple tasks like document typing or going on YouTube, it makes a huge difference. Everything feels so smooth. It has 8GB of DDR4 RAM in single channel, which runs at 2933MHz. Unlike some other Lenovo's, it has two DIMM slots, so you can easily upgrade the RAM to 32GB or even more. It also has a 256GB NVMe SSD. In terms of connectivity, it has Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0. It also has a 720p webcam, a 61 hour battery, and Harman Kardon speakers. I really don't think that 8GB of RAM is enough in 2021. Fortunately, for some reason, even if I ordered the 8GB version, Lenovo sent me a 16GB one. Therefore, I'll be doing all the tests with 16GB of RAM. As I mentioned earlier, it was selling for around 1000 Canadian or slightly under 1000 US dollars around Black Friday. While you have a lot of alternatives for 1000 dollars in the States, in Canada, 1000 dollars either gets you this or a Ryzen 5 4600H and a GTX 1650 combo. There is an ASUS that sells for 900 Canadian dollars. First up, we'll compare this computer with an HP Pavilion gaming laptop that has a Ryzen 5 4600H and a GTX 1650. This laptop became really popular in the States around Black Friday because you could get one for only 450 US dollars. We'll also compare it with other similarly priced laptops that has different GPUs and CPUs. In terms of ports, well, you get a lot. On the left side, there's a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, as well as a headphone microphone combo jack. On the right side, there is another USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port. And on the back, there is the charging plug, one HDMI 2.0 port, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, one USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C port, one gigabit Ethernet port, as well as a Kensington lock. Kudos to Lenovo for going for four USB-A ports and making them all USB 3.2. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's 2021, ditch the USB 2.0. On the other hand, I wish at least one of the USB ports were 10 gigabits. At 2.5 kilograms, it's not the lightest laptop ever. As expected, it doesn't support USB-C power delivery. The limit for power delivery is 100 watts, while the included charger is rated at 170 watts, so it wouldn't be enough. You can use the USB-C port to connect an external monitor though. 
With a thick base, I thought I could open the lid with one hand, but unfortunately, it's not possible. The 15.6 inch 1080p IPS panel covers 45% of the NTSC color gamut. That's not great, but it's something that we always see in this price point. I've actually yet to test a laptop with better color accuracy. It has a peak brightness of 250 nits. While it's perfectly serviceable indoors, if you intend to use this computer outside a lot, you might want to go for another computer or you might want to invest in an external monitor. The same thing applies if you intend to do a lot of professional video or photo editing. The viewing angles are good though. Next up, the keyboard and oh my god. This is by far the best keyboard I've ever typed on. And I have a mechanical keyboard with Cherry MX Red switches. The keys are very large, there is quite some distance between them, and there's plenty of travel. It is somewhat different than other laptop keyboards, so it does take some time to get used to, but once you do get used to it, it's very hard to go back to another laptop. This keyboard, combined with a high refresh rate screen, makes you want to keep typing. Key stabilization is also fantastic, even the spacebar. Although narrower than the rest of the keyboard, there's also a numpad if you're into that. The arrow keys are distanced apart from the rest of the keys, and they're bigger as well. I would expect the WASD keys to receive some special treatment as well. NumLock, Caps Lock, and the Escape keys have LEDs on them. I understand NumLock and Caps Lock, but why Escape? This is actually very smart, it indicates whether the FN lock is on. On most computers, the only way to see whether the FN lock is on or off is to actually press one of the function keys and see what it does. Lenovo clearly solved that problem. The keyboard is backlit, and although it's not RGB, it has two backlight levels. There isn't a fingerprint reader, and it doesn't support Windows Hello Facial Recognition. On the other hand, the trackpad is not on the same level. It's a Windows Precision trackpad, it's decently sized, and it's easy to use. The problem is, by default, it comes with some kind of trackpad acceleration. It works okay most of the time, but when it glitches, it's borderline impossible to use. It's nothing that a driver update can solve though. It's not a glass trackpad, but at this price point, it's not really a problem. It has Wi-Fi 6 and the reception is pretty good. The speeds you see on the screen are gathered at the same spot using the same server. It also has Bluetooth 5.0. It has a 720p camera and a dual microphone setup. Both the image and the sound quality are fine. It has two bottom firing speakers, one on each side. They go quite loud and the sound quality is not bad at all. There is virtually no bass, which is understandable, but otherwise, for YouTube, Netflix, gaming, it's perfectly fine. Before we start benchmarking, let me tell you real quick how I test these laptops. Normally, I would stop using my Dell and start using the new laptop. But as I'm in school right now, I need to take notes and my Dell has a pen, so I can't do that. Instead, I swap the desktop with my laptop. Aside from Windows Power Profiles, this laptop has three fan modes. You can either use the included Lenovo Vantage app or just press Fn and Q keys at the same time. The performance fan mode also applies a slight overclock to the GPU. We'll use this mode for benchmarks and games. Let's start with Cinebench. Unfortunately, our 10th gen Intel processors are still on 14 nanometers, while the AMD stack is on 7 nanometers. That being said, looking at Cinebench R15 single core, we see that the 10300H performs better than any other AMD processor. Its direct contender, the Ryzen 5 4600H, performs around 9% worse. The 10300H performs 13% better than its predecessor, the 9300H. On the other hand, as it only has 4 cores and 8 threads, it loses to 4600H in multi-core by a large margin. Cinebench R20 and R23 yield similar results. In both, our 10300H performs around 4% better in single core and around 35% worse in multi-core compared to our 4600H. We'll see how big of a difference it makes in real life applications. Looking at PC Mark 10, we see a completely different story. In productivity, we see that our Lenovo performs better than any other laptop on our stack. Not many apps are optimized for more than 4 cores and 8 threads, and as our 10300H has a better single core performance, I'm not surprised that it performs better in real life applications. In digital content creation, we see that the 10300H and the 4600H perform very similarly. One quick note, the performance difference between the 9300H and the 10300H is very impressive. We then converted a 1200MB 4K 30fps video to a 1080p MKV using the YouTube preset. Here, we see that the 10300H performs significantly better than the 9th gen i5s and the i7s. However, 
it still falls short of the Ryzen 4000 processors. Handbrake can take advantage of multiple cores and threads, and in this test, it shows. Quick note here, with the 10th Gen i5 processors and the 3rd Gen Ryzen processors, it really doesn't make sense to get a 2nd Gen Ryzen mobile processor. Exporting in Premiere is demanding for both the GPU and the CPU, so let's check that out. On my SSD, I have an 8 minute project with audio and plenty of effects, so let's check out the export performance. Our Lenovo performs around 13% better with laptops with the i5-9300H and is pretty much on par with the i7-9750H. Despite having 6 cores and 12 threads, the i7-10750H only performs around 1% better than our Lenovo. On the other hand, the 10300H performs 12% worse than the 4600H and 19% worse than the 4800H. Let's have a quick look at the built-in MATLAB benchmark. Our Lenovo with the 10300H finished in 2.51 seconds. It's pretty much on par with the Ryzen 5 4600H. On the other hand, it falls short of the i7 9750H, the 10750H, and the Ryzen 7 4800H. The 10300H performs around 10% better than its predecessor, the 9300H. Blender can take advantage of multiple cores and threads, and with only 4 cores and 8 threads, our Lenovo falls short of the AMD stack and the i7s. However, once more, the 10300H performs significantly better than the 9300H. Before we check out gaming, let's have a look at 3 d Mark. Graphics is fairly GPU-intensive, while physics is CPU-intensive. Firstly, we see that the GTX 1650 Ti on our Lenovo performs around 10% better than the GTX 1650s on our other laptops. It performs around 20% worse than a 1660 Ti. Looking at physics, we see a different story. Our 10300H can barely outperform its predecessor and falls short of the rest of the stack. This benchmark alone, it shows us that this laptop has the potential to be a great budget gaming laptop. And with this, let's move on to gaming. We have a lot to cover here. Let's start with CSGO. In 1080p high, our Lenovo averages 242 frames per second. While it performs around 20% worse than the 10750H-1660 Ti combo, it performs significantly better than the laptops with the GTX 1650, regardless of the processor. It is said that CSGO favors Intel processors anyway. By the way, as we're averaging more than 120 FPS, we can take full advantage of our high refresh rate display. In GTA 5, the difference isn't that big. Our Lenovo averages 129 FPS, which is around 10% better than the GTX 1650 laptops, and it performs around 15% worse than the 1660 Ti. GTA 5 is another game where we can take advantage of the 120Hz screen. Moving on to Far Cry 5, we see a different story. At 1080p high, our Lenovo averages 66 FPS, which isn't amazing, but at least it's still 10% higher than the 1650 laptops. We get the exact same averages in Far Cry New Dawn, as those two games are quite similar. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the 1650 Ti can't pull away like it has so far. Sure, 58 frames per second is still around 10% higher than 54, but it's only 4 frames. Also, 58 FPS isn't greater than a 60Hz screen, let alone a 120Hz one. We have a similar situation in Watch Dogs 2. We get 59 frames per second in 1080p high, which is only around 5% better than our 1650 laptops. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, having a higher refresh rate screen is useful in general, but not necessarily in games unless you have a very powerful graphics unit. This trend continues in Battlefield 5, Forza Horizon 4, and Eurotrack Simulator 2. Last summer, if you were looking for a new gaming laptop, at any given price point, you could either go AMD or Intel, and you would have the same graphics card. This isn't the case anymore. This Lenovo has a GTX 1650 Ti, instead of a regular 1650 found in our AMD laptops. Therefore, while it falls behind in CPU-intensive tasks, it can pull ahead in games and graphic-intensive tasks. Moreover, aside from having only 8GB of RAM, this Lenovo is a great all-rounder with fantastic build quality and a great keyboard. On the other hand, it might be too heavy for some people and not everyone will like the thick base. Thank you so much for watching, please consider pressing the like button, checking out my other videos, and subscribing to my channel. Take care.